Welcome to our Senior Flick segment of Talent Tales. Our guest today is Kuz LaRue. He resides here at Shepherd Village and he's a man of many talents. Kuz, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time to come here and join us to share your stories. I've heard that you have built cottages, homes, and creative sets for churches and ministries. Did you want to share with us where this passion started? It goes back to when I was very young. I was born in 1934, right down at the southern tip of Africa, in South Africa. But I grew up in what is now Zimbabwe. And this is during the Great Depression and then followed by the Second World War. And being in the middle of Africa, we couldn't get any supplies. So we learned to make do. I can remember when I was very young, my father built some of our furniture out of packing cases. That's the only wood that was available. So I would help him on all sorts of projects. My mother was a great gardener, so I would work in the garden with her. Uh, I kept all sorts of animals, dogs, cats, rabbits, uh, fish I had, racing pigeons, and uh, I just liked animals, gardening, and working with my hands to create something. Now the interesting thing is when I left school, this is still in Zimbabwe, I was an apprentice draftsman, drawing, for five years, which is the way it was done there in those days. In the evening, you go to night school, it's all part of the training. And to draw anything, you have to visualize it in your mind before you start. Otherwise, you, you don't know where you're going. So I do the same with any project that I'm working with. Before I even start on it, I like to back off and say, what am I trying to achieve here? What do I want? How do I want it to look when it's finished? And then you know what the steps are. But uh, so wherever my, my talents, such as they are, could be used, I got involved in especially in the later years in the churches, because uh, my wife and I were saved back in 1957. We married in 58. And uh, we spent some years in the churches and some church planting and building new churches in Africa. Then we came to Canada in 62. And uh, I spent the first year in, way up in northern Ontario, northern Quebec, working on the radar bases because it was part of the Cuban Missile Crisis was on at the time. And I was actually report, uh, recruited in England to come and work on those radar bases because they didn't have Canadian technicians who were accustomed to microwave technology in those days. So we who'd done that sort of work were recruited. So my, I led a whole group of immigrants from England and Germany and, and so on, and New Zealand, who all, all those countries worked with microwave technology, but that's not used here in North America at that time. So anyway, uh, I got involved in a number of different churches, was in, on the board and various other activities in uh, Stone Church downtown Toronto for 22 years and then during that time I spent two periods in Africa, one 18 months in South Africa and four years in Zimbabwe. <coughs> and church planting is something my wife and I did. We never had family, children, so we were free to come and go. So we traveled a lot to the passion of ours and we went to probably 40 to 50 different countries on four continents over the years and uh, I was involved in church planting in Canada as well but uh, I, I realized when we came to Canada the two of us we were about, married about four or five years then we arrived in this country 
with a suitcase of old clothes and a total of $700 between the two of us. That's it. That's all we had. So we, we really started at rock bottom. So while we were working and renting an apartment, I knew that if I didn't get some um, money together that I could earn outside of my job, that we'd never have a home of our own. So I bought a couple of acres of land up near Bancroft. Well, it's a real, real remote bush up there on the lake. There's no hydro there. So it took me four years to build a cottage on that land. Mm -hmm. And at the end, of, we would buy, you know, a couple of bags of cement this week, and a couple of, you know, whatever supplies we could afford out of our salaries each week and take it up there. And then at the end of four years, I sold it and that gave me the money to deposit on a house in Richmond Hill. And so we worked and we paid that off as well. So this is one reason why I, I work outside of a job, shall I say. Um, at that stage was for a purpose, to earn money for myself. But since we got basically financially settled, I did a lot of volunteer work with various churches and um, the last 22 years I was with People's Church in Toronto and they have a, a Living Truth TV program. So I worked in their workshops part-time because they had other activities uh, for most of those 22 years and building sets for the TV, building sets on the platform, and that platform 66 feet wide and 18 feet high, so we're talking big stuff. And then in the hallways and, you know, the missions conferences and all these other things. So it was a very busy time. I dropped out a year ago now. I'm getting, getting on in old age, and I basically just concentrated here in Shepherd Village now and my membership is now with a church in the village. And I worked with Amanda when we were doing, um, the, what do you call it, the uh, Vacation Bible School for Seniors. So I did a lot of their backgrounds and stuff there. Um, so the Lord gives you talents, use them. So I was happy to be able to it. Now, <clears throat> the other thing is, I, as I say, I built its cottage from scratch, and there was no hydro up there, by the way. It's very remote. I had to cut all of that timber and those four foot eight sheets of flooring and everything with a handsaw. And uh, the other thing is I couldn't lift the rafters up there, so I had to build them on the ground and design them in such a way that I could take a piece up at a time and then assemble them up there without something falling on my head, of course. So fortunately, I was able to do that. And then when we bought this house in Richmond Hill, I built a double story addition on the back. I, there was a cold room there and I just tore that out and built a double story section there. Uh, on the top floor, I put in a I call it a sunroom. It had 18-foot cathedral ceilings with, uh, what do you call it, sky skylights. And we were able to, both of us enjoyed gardening. We had a garden in that thing that survived all winter. At one stage we had more than 200 uh, African violets, and these are all specialists that we managed to accumulate over the years. And then outside I had a big garden. We bought this house, we looked at a number of houses, and I think I looked more at the garden, at the land, than the house. My wife looked more at the kitchen. And so anyway, we, we bought this house and very, very pleased. So uh, I retired when I, I worked the last eight years in Richmond Hill. I was leading a, a printing company's night shift. So I worked night shift for 18 years. And what I liked about that is it's a four day a week. 
So it gave me a three-day weekend every weekend to do my passions and my projects. So uh, I brought a few pictures. I don't know if yeah, there's anything that here that suits you. A couple you. of photos. Did you want to share them with us and yeah, take us okay. down the Well, I met my wife when she was 17 and I was 18. Mm -hmm. It took us five years to get married. So that's our wedding picture. You guys look amazing. You are such a beautiful wife. We had 53 years together, and uh, she died right here in Shepherd Manor, in Shepherd Gardens. She, was never, she had breast cancer. She never had uh, one day in hospital. She wanted to be home with me. And I had some nursing experience because when I was young, I was a volunteer with the St. John Ambulance over there, which is somewhat similar to Red Cross. So we did a lot of nursing and attending sports events and wherever people are liable to get injured. So I did have experience and she didn't want to go to any hospital. So we, we, uh, I looked after her for six years before she died. So anyway, our passion was after we met, as I say, it took us five years to get married, but we were involved in what was big in those days, ballroom dancing. Now this is not the sort of stuff you see today. It was very elegant, whereas the stuff today is more athletic and it's more... Anyway, it's not what I call ballroom dancing. So perhaps this will give you some idea of what we were like when we were in our boring days. A classic black and white picture. We started off as the amateur level and we worked our way up to the championships of our country. We've danced against people from New Zealand, Australia, England, France and South Africa and so on. Anyway, we got saved in 1957 and we never danced another step after that. And the main reason was the lifestyle that went with ballroom dancing. And we just didn't want any part of that. So anyway, we, uh, maybe I can talk a bit later what we did when we came to Canada and we uh, worked in Richmond Hill. Uh, as I said, I was a very keen gardener. Here's the front of our house. We had a, a corner lot, and we often heard cars and then back up. They just sat and looked at our garden. We had a magnificent garden, if I say so. This is like one of the beds next to the, the driveway. What was your favorite flower? Ah, anything that's, uh, that, uh, that lasts in water. I don't like something to die after all the efforts we put into it. So the other thing is we had a, I had a big vegetable garden at the back. And so here's a picture of my wife. We were picking strawberries and sampling as we went along. The other thing in the vegetable patch in Richmond Hill is mostly Italian people. And they grew tomatoes, big stuff, because they canned, most families would can three or 400 bottles, big bottles. Uh, tomatoes every year. So I took them on too because they had a competition. You had to produce the biggest tomato of the year and it had to be at least two pounds before you could enter. Now I don't know if any of you know what a two pound tomato looks like. Here's, here's a, a picture of a two pound tomato. By the time we cut that slice it was hanging over the edges of the of the plate. So anyway, this is something. This is interesting. I I had a, a, a mallard duck that came every year and nested right now uh, by my front door, but in the garden itself. So I named her Soda. Soda. 
Yeah, because you see, ducks are quackers, so her full name's Soda Quacker. Anyway, here's Soda sitting at, at my front door on her eggs. Okay, so I don't know what else of interest. Yeah, we would talk a bit about, I built a cottage. It's just a bare piece of land on a lake up there. The first uh, time I went up there, I had to chop a lot of stuff out of the way so I could get my car off the, ro off the road. But anyway, this is, I built part of the cottage and we lived in that while I put an L shape across the front. So here's the, the framework anyway of the second half. Now, as I mentioned, there's no hydro up there, so I had to cut everything by hand, so it took me four years to build a cottage. Anyway, they sold it at a good price, and the people who bought it were very happy. So that's it. So then we bought a house in Richmond Hill, and I decided that the cold room on the back wasn't good enough, so I tore it right off and built and this is, I hope, uh, it's a poor color because I didn't know it, but my friend who took the picture was using night film in the daytime. And this is in film days. But this is more, a little further along. Is that the house that you built or is that the cottage? Yeah. So this is uh, the, the section I built on the back later. So. <coughs> So, Coos, you built many things. Well, yeah, over the years, wherever there's a need, I'll join in. I'll, you know, at the church, I'll, if they need some changes in the kitchen, I don't know, I'll get in there and I'll do the plumbing, electrical work, whatever. The only thing I didn't do with electrical work is the final work on the panel, power panel. You have to get a licensed electrician to do that. But I did everything else. So Coos, you have built many things. I've heard that you have an interesting story to share with us about a roof. Well, when you've got lots of help, you can do things differently. But I, would, I work totally alone to do everything right from mm -hmm. digging the foundation, laying the concrete, mixing the concrete in a wheelbarrow. And by the time I got to the roof, and, and this roof here, for instance, as I said, the it was a cathedral roof, and it had, I think, uh, inside was about 12 feet. Now, I couldn't carry a, a rafter up, which was 18 feet wide. I couldn't get the rafters up there because it was far too heavy for me. So I literally cut it and designed it on the ground in little pieces and took a piece up at a time. So I had to prop it up while I was assembling it, so it's quite complex, but it uh, and also added a lot of extra work, of course. But the, I did the job, and in in the end, uh, we were very very happy with the results. My wife was quite pleased, and for any married man, he knows he's got to keep his wife happy, mm. and so I followed her wishes as to what she wanted. So she got what she wanted and she was very happy. Mm. So now that I'm living at Shepherd Village, uh, I can't help it, I get involved. So I've been on and off uh, for, for about 18 years now on the Shepherd Gardens Residence Council, which is an elected group. And I'm still the president there now. And I'm very pleased to say that I have an excellent council that works with me and we instituted a, a, a broad range of social programs at the gardens. I've always emphasized that I want to see all the residents as one big family. And to a large degree, that is how it is in our building. The other thing that I very happy about is we've managed to keep COVID out of our building. Mm. We haven't had one person in our building who 
had to go to a hospital or anything for COVID. I have a, a burden for the health, safety, and happiness of the people in Shepherd Village, not just the gardens where I live and I'm involved. I try to keep produce or uh, push the whole of Shepherd Village as a unit. Um, and it is something that some people don't understand that. They think because I live in this building, the doors are closed. I don't want to know about the rest of the village. And I don't like that. I, we're all part of Shepherd Village. We're all part of the village people. And we have responsibilities and so on to each other. And this is my uh, way of looking at, at uh, living here. Now, I've actually lived here 23 years. Just a couple of days ago, the, village, the gardens I bought before the building was finished, by the way. It's a oh, condo. Wow. And so I moved in the 1st of February, 99, and I'm, I'm still here. Uh, I've seen a lot of changes here in the village and in the churches. But uh, I realize my physical abilities and to a certain degree my mental acuity is declining. I'm just coming up 88 now and uh, you can't avoid the things that happen to your body and your mind and so on. But I'm grateful that I'm still reasonably active and reasonably I've got most of my marbles still so I've lost you a few no do. doubt <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, that's inevitable but anyway uh, what else can I tell you it's, it's well you still have to tell us what's your favorite thing that you built <laughs> you haven't told us yet <laughs> oh no there's so many things so many things uh, one thing when we did uh, the Vacation Bible School here, yeah, we had the, the, the one year we did the story of Joseph in Egypt and so on. So the first part was in Egypt. So I built an eight by eight foot sphinx and carved it all out and painted all the gold and royal blue and everything. It was beautiful, even if I say so myself. But uh, you know, just, just, just add to the atmosphere. And then we built a framework the whole way around the, the hall and we put uh, stone, what do you call it, like a, a roll of stuff that looked like big stonework all the way around. And then above there was uh, uh, pyramids and that sort of thing. So if people looking from the outside and just look at that, they'll see um, a, a, a picture of ancient Egypt. But if they go around the back, they'll see it. it's just, I, I just use cheap uh, one by two strapping for the frameworks and so on, and a couple of screws here and there, just so it doesn't fall on somebody. But it was very successful. It sounds you, very beautiful. You can, uh, you can produce something very, um, Impressive if you look at it from one side only. Hmm. Just don't go and look at the back. <laughs> You're such a seasoned builder. Do you have any advice that you'll give young people who want to start building? Well, first thing I would say is do it. <laughs> you only learn by doing. Hmm. And nobody really taught me how to use tools. I watched my dad a little bit and I knew which was the sharp end to stay away from, but that's about where I started. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bought a few things that I'm glad don't exist anymore. But no, my advice to anybody is do it. You know, just if you see a need, meet it. Don't ask. Don't look for help if necessary. Get started. Once you start it, you'll find others will join you. Mm -hmm. They want somebody to get the, do the initial push. 
So if you see an, uh, a project or anything that interests you, start it, let people know about it, and you'll see others will come in behind you and work with you. But they need that initial push. Mm. And you be it. That's amazing Just advice. Just do it. Thank you so much for that wisdom and for taking the time to come on our show and to share your stories. And I hope you will keep on building.